This talk will cover approaches for working with electronic health records, EHRs, using machine learning, including unsupervised representation learning for medical text, codes, visits, and patients. Also, working with time series events using MLPs and RNNs. In the field of EHR, let's look at what methods are currently being used. A study in 2018 produced the statistics shown here. First, we can see that the overall trend of deep learning in EHR is going up, which is great. We can see that the main application areas are representation learning and prediction, with a large focus on unsupervised methods and sequence models. This is great because that is what this talk is about. Let's start by talking about why we want concept representations. In the case of text in a clinical note or a publication, we may want to reason about these programmatically. We can do this with a vector representation of the text or the words, or also just a patient or a hospital. If we represent a clinical publication as a vector, we can compare it to other publications to perform a search, or in the case of clinical notes, search for similar patients. We can also look to see if a current clinical note is very different from existing notes to detect errors in the case that an unlikely word is used. We can also build representations for words and examine relationships between them to better understand drugs and diseases. Imagine doing this to study relationships between patients, doctors, visits, diseases, drugs, or symptoms. It is a computational approach to perform a literature review or find candidate drugs. We can then also use these concepts programmatically for searching and reasoning about things in other tasks. Now, what can we do with word embeddings in particular? We can compose these words together to represent documents or use them as a component in other models, such as RNNs, to augment small data sets. Some interesting work has been done using word embeddings for non-medical data, such as learning basic compositionality of words just from processing text, which is shown on the lower left, or by considering words over time to be different and seeing how they are grouped based on that word's usage in that time period. On the lower right, we can see how the representation of a word broadcast changed between 1850 and 1990. This corresponds to how we think about this word. Imagine if this instead represented a drug over time to observe off-label use, or how a disease changed over different geographic environments. These experiments could be very interesting applications to the medical field, but this has largely been unexplored. Now let's talk a bit about how these models work. First, we'll talk about how to encode tokens, such as words or phrases. Deciding how to tokenize text is a first challenge, as phrases of words may have unique meanings compared to the words they are composed of, and should be considered their own tokens. We won't tackle that challenge here, but it is typically a lot of manual rules. Here we have three example tokens, and we're going to encode them into a one-hot vector, each. This means that the vector is all zeros except for a single element which is one. The index of that element is uniquely assigned to that word. And the length of these vectors is equal to the number of tokens that exist in the vocabulary. The reason this works is that it identifies an embedding in another matrix. When we apply the vector to a weight matrix, only one column is selected. This allows us to change the embedding size just by changing the dimensions of the weight matrix. Also, if we have more than one one in a vector, we'll call this a multi-hot vector, and they can come in handy as well. Now, let's talk about the word devec model. With this approach, the assumption is that the context of a word defines that word. For some example, string, shown at the top here, involving respiratory system and other chest symptoms. We're going to focus on a target example word here, system, which is shown in green. 
Each word will be a target word at some point during this training, unless it is, a, unless it is an ignore word, uh, such as and or some other filler word. We beforehand decide on a context. So here our context size is two, uh, which means that we'll find words within a distance of two to our target word. Here, these are shown in yellow. This will be considered as one training example. First, we will make a one-hot vector representing the target word and project it down to a 2D representation. Now, the embedding size can vary. Here, we're just doing 2D. Then, we will project it back up to generate the context of that word. This is impossible to do perfectly because a word can have multiple different contexts, but that will be the key to why this method works. Let's take a more formal look at this. Our input is a one-hot vector x. The embedding of this concept is z. And our context is a multi-hot vector c. To encode this, we will use a weight matrix to create z, which is, as you recall, just selecting a vector from the first weight matrix w. Then, to decode, we will multiply z, our embedding, by the second weight matrix w2, and then apply a softmax function to make it sum to 1. This output is not multi hot it is a probability distribution. We will apply a loss to, mac to maximize the likelihood of these probabilities to make the prediction as close as possible to all contexts of that word. Solving this over all words at the same time gives this method its power. Here is a small demonstration of the model being trained on a very small set of data. All words in the vocabulary are shown here. The code to reproduce the plots is provided at this URL, and we will go over some parts of it. One challenge is how to generate training examples. First, all words are replaced by IDs. So for a sentence like Paris, France, capital, it is converted to a list of IDs, 2, 5, 11. We focus on one word at a time as the center or focus word. We generate a list of pairs where the words appeared in each other's context. We can then train a model using a single pair at a time, which over the entire data set will minimize error over all the contexts at once. So it's equivalent to the example that we saw before. The model is shown here in PyTorch. We create two weight matrices, one to encode and one to decode. To encode, the size is embedding times vocab and to decode, it is vocab times embedding. To complete a forward pass, we will take the focus vector, which is a one-hot vector, and perform these two matrix transformations, and then take a softmax. The code here is using a log softmax, so that's just to be compatible with the loss. We can just think of this uh, intuitively as a softmax. Now let's take a closer look at the softmax function. If our vocabulary has three words, then the model will output three real valued, possibly negative outputs. The outputs are first exponentiated, where they become positive, then they are normalized to sum to one and become a probability distribution. In the three-dimensional case, it is easy to visualize how the function will behave. Each combination of outputs can be plotted on this triangle, also called the simplex. 
With this, we can visualize how the loss function will behave. As the training will try to move a single output to minimize the loss, we can see the impact on the other outputs. We can see that the model can also learn from the data indirectly using a process of elimination. And this in intuition will help us understand uh, how these models are going to learn. To get some further intuition, this visualization lets you see how a linear change impacts the softmax over three outputs. This demo is available at the link shown in the bottom right. Now, applying a cross-entropy loss, we can compute the sum of the true class times the log of the prediction. Here, yi is 1 in only one place. So it is simply the natural log of one specific output probability that is negated. Our goal will be to minimize this term which will in effect maximize the probability 0 0.87, which in turn will minimize the other outputs due to the softmax. Now let's talk about a good data source. PubMed makes a subset of their papers open in a computer-friendly format. This data set has been used for a lot of research, such as what we will discuss next. Over 1 million articles that are grouped by journal and year are made available in an easy-to-parse format. The XML files are organized by sections of the paper, so that it is easy to grab just the abstracts or the conclusions. Let's look at a study that looked at word embeddings in a medical setting. This makes an important aspect of these methods very clear, that representations are biased by the data they are trained on. We can use this to our advantage to learn how relationships vary between datasets. Here, this work trains a model on a private EHR dataset from Mayo Clinic, the open PubMed subset, Wikipedia, and Google News. Each of these data sets has their own bias, and we can observe that bias. Here, they study how three different target words vary between data sets. The word embedding for each target word is computed for each model. Then, that embedding is compared to all other embeddings for that corpus. The five closest are shown. They are ordered, showing the closest at the top. We can see for diabetes that the EHR dataset had the full name written often, while the Google News dataset likely had articles about related studies. For peptic ulcer disease, we can see the EHR dataset specifies types of ulcers, while the Google News dataset specifies symptoms. And finally, we can see for colon cancer that there is a relationship for all datasets relating this to breast cancer. And we can see a typo in the EHR data for the word cancer. Now, let's look at another public data set of radiology reports from Indiana University Hospital. Here, we have over 1,000 reports in a computer-friendly XML format, indicating the findings that were present, as well as a plain text description from the radiologist. Here is some Python code to clean up this data set into a format we can work with. We need to parse the XML in order to find the findings node and then extract and clean the text from it. The output we get is a list of strings that we can use to extract tokens and their contexts in order to train a model. 
Now, trying to train a model on this new text introduces some challenges because it's a lot larger than the previous data set. The settings used during training can greatly influence the resulting model. We call these hyperparameters. These are things like the dimension of the embedding, the learning rate of the optimizer, the token words used, and the context window size. Here are two different dimension sizes projected into 2D so we can see them. Typically, we can expect that when things are in a big ball, that no real relationship was learned and that everything just has a similar distance to each other. And when there is one sharp feature, like on the right, this indicates that we don't have enough space in the embedding to represent what's needed to be represented to explain the data. This, this model on the right is likely underfit and tried to output averages of all the contexts. We can inspect these models using the same approach that we discussed before, but for the focus word spine. We can see in lower dimensions, the distances are a lot higher than when compared to the 100 dimensions, where they are all a very similar distance. It is hard to see any pattern for either of these. The process of training these models is iterative, and it can be challenging to learn patterns given the data if it's possible at all to learn patterns. Typically, models are trained with millions of examples. 